everyone. Welcome to another episode of Echo Live. My name is Paulette, and I'm coming at you, at you live from the Michigan Science Center's planetarium, which is why it kind of looks like I'm sitting in a cave down here. Um, so, uh, for those of you that have not joined us before, welcome, and for those of you that have joined us, welcome back. Please make sure to introduce yourself in the chat feature. Uh, that will give us the opportunity to communicate with each other throughout the program. So whether you're watching on Zoom, YouTube, or on Facebook, that chat feature is the best way to communicate if we're having any audio or video issues, as well as asking some questions during the program. And I'll be asking questions of you as well. So today, as our virtual planetarium title might uh, might allude to, we're going to be talking about meteors and meteoroids and meteorites. We're going to be talking about all of those today. So, um, in the chat feature, let's go ahead again. There we go. In the chat feature, tell me what is a meteor. Using that chat feature, tell me, what is a meteor? What might we call a meteor? And this can be kind of a tricky question. So again, using that chat feature, whether you are on YouTube or Facebook or here on Zoom, use that chat feature to tell me, what is a meteor? What is a meteor? Hmm. Well, it turns out that a meteor is a streak of light that we see ac going across the sky. So we sometimes call meteors shooting stars. There's also something called a meteorite. Meteorites are one that streak of light actually produces something that hits the ground. And a meteoroid is what it is out in space. So we have meteoroid out in space, so small object stuff out in space, usually rocky origin. So that's a meteoroid. And then when it zooms in through our atmosphere and burns up, it's a meteor meteoroid, meteor, and meteorite is what we find on the ground. Now, sometimes asteroids or larger space objects also come through our atmosphere. Um, when, when they come through our atmosphere, we still call it a meteor and a meteorite when we find them on the ground. Asteroids are just much, much bigger versions of the rocky things that we find out in space. So today we're going to focus on some of those meteors because we actually have something going on in just a week or so. We have a meteor shower that we're going to be able to see. So let's go ahead and switch on over to our virtual planetarium so that we can see where we're going to find this meteor shower up in the real nighttime sky. Now you'll notice that I've actually set our sky to August 12th right here at 3.30 in the morning. August 12th is actually when this meteor shower peaks. You're going to start to be able to see some of these meteors or streaking rocks across the sky starting as early as this week. Um, but it peaks or has its uh, largest concentration next week. And we'll be able to see that pretty early in the morning. This meteor shower is called the Perseid meteor shower. The Perseid meteor shower is actually one of our meteor showers that gives off the most number of meteors that we're able to see throughout the year. The meteor shower, uh, the Perseid meteor shower usually gives us a pretty fantastic show. Um, a, from anywhere between 50 and 100 meteors per hour. So that means if you go outside and you sit back and look 
up in the sky, you might be able to see up to about 100 meteors per hour. So you should be able to count 100 as they streak across the sky. We might not see that many, um, but this is one of our better meteor showers that we're able to see. Now I call it the Perseid meteor shower. And that's because it's actually inside of a constellation called Perseus. So Perseus is up in our sky right here. And he was a great hero. Perseus actually holds on to the head of Medusa. And we'll talk about Perseus and Medusa a little bit later on in one of our programs because he's a fall constellation. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, but if you go outside at about 3.30 in the morning and you look towards the north northeast, you'll be able to see meteors streaking off from this area of the sky. Now we call it the Perseid meteor shower because that's where the Per, uh, that's where uh, the per Perseid meteor shower actually originates from. Um, uh, if we called it the Orionid meteor shower, where do you think those meteors would start from? We called it the Orionid meteor shower. So here we have the Perseid meteor shower and the constellation of Perseus the hero. Now to see some more uh, to actually find this in the sky, the best thing to do is to look to the sky um, from, uh, to look to the sky in the northeast, north, northeast or so. Uh, Evan from Texas asked me if I'm using Stellarium. That's right. That is the program that I'm using. Stellarium is a free program that you can download online. And there's even a, a web version of it that we can use. Uh, maybe we'll do, actually do uh, an electronic tools uh, virtual planetarium in the, in the future so I can show you guys how this actually works. Um, and yes, Perseus was a Greek myth. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why he's carrying the head of Medusa. You can also see some of our other constellation friends that we might see in the uh, winter sky specifically. We've talked about some of our winter constellations if you've been following us through Echo Live. Right here we have Capella, which is in the star of Orion, or in the constellation of Orion, the chariot here. And we have the star Aldebaran, which is in the star, uh, constellation of Taurus the Bull. Now, Perseus is a little bit harder to find up in the sky, but like I said, if you go outside and you look to the north northeast, you should be able to see things sort of streaking across the sky, and those things are meteors. They are little bits of stuff burning up in our atmosphere. Now, this one actually um, is part of a comet tail. So as the Earth goes around the sun, we actually every once in a while hit a trail of debris from a comet um, and that will actually cause these meteor showers that we see. Um, and so we are moving towards uh, and moving through uh, one of those comet tails right now, which is going to give us the Perseid meteor shower. So this is a really neat thing to go outside and take a look for. Now, I said that it peaks on the 12th. And one of the reasons why I suggest you wait to go outside uh, until maybe next week is because of our moon. So right now, our moon is actually pretty bright. Um, we are just about, let me see. Today is the 6th, so we are just about right now to, I think we're actually really close to a full moon. So as we continue forward in time, um, the moon is going to start to get smaller and smaller, and we're going to see less and less of it up in the sky, which is why I encourage you to sort of wait and see uh, in just about a week or so, uh, you'll be able to see less of the moon. So if we go back to the 12th, we'll actually see that the moon is in the constellation Taurus instead, and it's much, much thinner. Uh, the best way to watch a meteor shower is to actually, not with a pair of binoculars, not with a telescope, but to go outside with a lounge chair or a blanket on the ground, that's how I love to watch them. 
Uh, one year when I was with, uh, when I was living at home with my parents, we actually took all of the couch cushions off of the couch and we laid them out onto the, the grass and we watched the meteor shower that way. Now, before you do that, I do suggest that you ask for your parents' permission before taking all of the couch cushions off of the couch. Um, but it was a fantastic way for me to be able to watch that. I was uh, probably about four years old when I saw my first meteor shower. And of course, it was the Perseid meteor shower. Um, so the best way to see them is to just lay out under the stars and wait and watch. That's one of the reasons why I love meteor showers is you can wait and watch. And while you're doing that, you can find some of the other constellations or things that we've talked about during our programs that you've seen throughout our Echo Live experience together. No special hardware required. Um, and again, a pair of binoculars is always nice, but you're not going to be able to see the meteors through a pair of binoculars unless you're really lucky. Um, if you do have a camera that you can set up to do longer exposures, you'll actually be able to see that streak going across it. Um, when I was in college and doing some of my research, I actually was able to see uh, meteors streaking across some of my research when I was doing, uh, when I was trying to look at something else. It was cool, but it was also kind of annoying because it was ruining my data. But <laughs> <laughs> um, each to their own, we're all looking for different things. So um, that is one thing that I super suggest you take a look for. Uh, if you're outside at 3.30 in the morning to watch the Perseid meteor shower, don't forget that down over here, we also have the planet Venus. So it's going to be really bright up in our morning sky. Um, personally, I like to I like to start stargazing for this meteor shower at about midnight or one o'clock in the morning and then I'll stay out until about four o'clock in the morning when I when I do my observing for this one um, and I also like to get as far away from city lights as possible I'm actually heading out camping this weekend or that weekend um, so that I can get a better look uh, you can sometimes see these meteors from the city though some of these meteors are huge and they make this really big fireball or streak across the sky. If they're really big, there's something that we call a, uh, a bolide. And if they're even bigger, there's something that we call a fireball. So if I change us on over here, we're actually going to be able to see a really bright fireball. This is actually over the city of Detroit. So just a couple of years ago in 2018, a fireball flew over Detroit and exploded in the air. When it exploded, it gave off this huge flash of light and this huge boom. I live downtown Detroit and it was actually over um, this part of Michigan, which is actually pretty far north of where I live. And I was still able to see the flash and hear the boom. So I want to show you uh, sort of an example of when this happened. A lot of people were actually able to catch this meteor on camera and this giant fireball. So if I hit play right here, there isn't any audio with this, uh, but we're going to be able to see this person was just driving and they had one of those dashboard cams. It lit up the entire sky and sort of looked like it sort of looked like a bolt of lightning, except huge. This big fireball was coming in. This was in January of 2018, um, and we were able to see just the whole sky lit up. And like I said, even from downtown Detroit, pretty far away, I could hear the boom from my apartment. And some people said that they were actually able to feel the boom um, from their location. So let's go ahead and switch back on over to our power plane here, because I wanna talk a little bit about, we talked a little bit about, um, meteors and meteoroids. Meteoroids are just chunks of rock most of the time out in space. Um, and asteroids, again, also chunks of rock out in space. 
But what happens when they hit our atmosphere? What happens when these things actually come into our atmosphere on the earth? Well, because of all of the friction and all of the heat that's provided, when you rub your hands together, you can actually start to feel some of that heat between your hands. That's happening in the upper part of our atmosphere. And it's heating up and it's heating up and it's heating up until they get so hot that the, some of them will melt. They might explode. Um, they do all sorts of weird things. They Little pieces will break off. Some of them burn up completely because they were too small. Um, but meteorites are what lands on the surface. And we've had meteorites landing on the surface for a really long time. Asteroids, really big chunks of rock out in space, uh, loosely collected chunks of rock out in space, have actually come into our atmosphere and hit the surface. And that actually caused the death of some of our, some of our favorite extinct animals, dinosaurs. So if I show you right here, we're going to see our, this is actually Meteor Crater. So Meteor Crater was caused by something really big, probably asteroid uh, sized, uh, actually crashing through our atmosphere, heating up and slamming into the surface. So when we were talking about, um, when we were talking about, oops, um, craters on the surface of, say, the moon, the Earth has craters too. We've been bombarded by these small asteroids and comets as well throughout our history. Now, the reason that we have fewer giant craters like this is because the Earth has weather. It has erosion. It has an atmosphere to actually burn up and block some of those meteors and asteroids from hitting the surface, or meteorites and asteroids from hitting the surface. So this one in particular is Meteor Crater. And you might look right here. This is the visitor center for Meteor Crater. Just to get a little bit of a size comparison, um, you can't even see, oh, there we go. There, I think this is a tour bus right here. Tour bus right down there, just to give you a little bit of a, a size comparison. And you might ask, how did this visitor center survive when it, when this area got hit by a, by a asteroid? Of course it didn't. This was actually created after that was made. I've had that question before, so I just want to preempt it. Um, so this is uh, one of those cr giant craters that is created. Now, the fireball that exploded over Michigan a couple of years ago was only about the size of a school bus. And I know that sounds really big, but um, because it was only about the size of a school bus, the only pieces that we found, most of it broke up. So that was one of those like, huge booms that you saw up in the sky. Um, most of it broke up and then fell back down to the earth. When it fell back down to the earth, I think the largest piece that they found was just over an inch. So pretty small pieces still uh, that were able to break, make it down to the surface and only a couple of pieces were found. Um, so, if you have a meteorite or you think you have a meteorite, there's one thing that you can sort of, you can do some research to figure out if what you have is a meteorite or a meteor wrong. So, these are some different types of meteorites that exist. We have uh, our chondrites, and so they have like little bubbles inside of them. We have iron meteorites. Uh, we have palisite meteorites and a chondrite meteorites. Some of them are stony, some of them are meteor, or, or some of them are, are, are iron rich, some of them are both. So if you think you have a meteorite, the best thing to do is to go online and research different types of meteorites. See what you can find. Um, sometimes people have come to the Science Center with really, really large pieces of what they think is an iron meteorite. 
Now, like I said, the piece of the of the most recent one that exploded over Michigan, the pieces that we found were only about an inch. So imagine what kind of explosion or what kind of fireball we'd see if the pieces were this big when they hit the ground. That would be crazy. It would leave a huge crater. So if you find something that you think might be a meteorite, consider the size. Most meteorites that you might find, unless you physically see the fireball, are going to be really, really small pieces. Um, the, some of them are going to be magnetic, but some of them aren't. Some of them are actually just stony. So just because it's magnetic doesn't necessarily mean that it's a meteorite. We've had a lot of people here, especially in the Detroit area, bring us iron slag from foundries. So sort of the leftover stuff um, when they're making steel. Uh, so that leftover stuff can sometimes look like a meteorite, but it actually turns out that it's just kind of dirty stuff that's given off in the steel making process. Um, so these, do your research um, before you uh, think that you have a meteorite. Make sure it falls into one of the categories of meteorites. Um, the prettiest one I think is the palisite because you can actually see through it, which is really, really cool. Um, and then if you think you have a meteorite, the next best thing is to take it to uh, your local geologist. So a lot of people bring them to me because they're because I'm an astronomer. And once they hit the ground, they're somebody else's problem. No, I, I can also take a look at them as well. Uh, but I don't have the same qualifications as a geologist does they can tell you if they think it's Earth, uh, if it if it originated on Earth, or if it originated someplace else. Um, from there, they usually have to send it on to NASA because there aren't a lot of places that can actually test these things to tell you whether or not it's a meteorite. Um, so if you think you have a meteorite, definitely do your research, take it to your local geologist or science center, um, and then we can definitely help you from there. Uh, but again, remember, if it's this big, unless it left a giant hole in the ground, it's probably not a meteorite. Um, so I encourage you, like I said, to go outside and take a look, try and find some of these sort of, or and try and find the, uh, meteors that I'm talking about with our Perseid meteor shower. And I'm also going to ask if anybody has any questions about our program today or any space related questions, any suggestions for programs in the future. Uh, Evan says that one time my dad was uh, in a parking lot and found a lot of people crowding over a meteorite. That is super, super cool. There's a lot of people that actually collect pieces of space rock. They collect meteorites. Um, and those people are also really good resources if you think you have a meteorite to go and double check to see if you do. So you could tell on the other slide that um, these different types of meteorites actually originate from different areas. So for example, this chondri chondritic stony meteorite originates from a small rocky meteoroid or asteroid. When these come in through our atmosphere, they'll compress down, they'll heat up. Um, and so those are some of the ones that we're seeing as the chond chondritic stony meteorites. If the asteroid is bigger, however, if the asteroid has a core that means that we're going to see some more of the iron meteorites because if it doesn't have enough uh, stuff in it to melt the iron, we're not going to see that iron down here on the surface of the earth. Um, so they, these actually come from different areas of the asteroid that we have right here. It's got a crust, it's got a mantle, it's got a core, and the achondritic Stony meteorites are actually coming from the outside. The palisite are coming from sort of that mantle area, and that's why they look sort of glassy and kind of cool. Um, and then the iron meteorites are coming from the core of whatever object that might be uh, might be exploding at that time. 
So I don't see any questions coming in. Um, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about dwarf planet. So I'm super excited about that one. So next Thursday, we'll be talking about that. Don't forget that Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2.30 Eastern, that is when we're doing our Echo Live programs. Uh, you'll see Anna and myself and our other MySci friends around. The Michigan Science Center is also open. So don't forget that we're open as well. And uh, lastly, if you are in the Detroit area and you're looking for something fun to do, we have something called Spark in the Park activities happening on Saturdays. Um, so check out our website. You'll be able to see or you'll be able to find sort of those Spark in the Park activities on our website. You'll be able to register there. Um, but this week we're actually doing orienteering. So we're going to be learning about how to use a compass and a map. Um, so that one will definitely be a lot of fun. Ah, and thank you. Yes, absolutely. Next week, Wednesday at one o'clock, um, we're going to be doing a free global soundscapes. So uh, if you check our, our video a couple of days ago, um, double check uh, in, in the comments and see uh, if you can find sort of a registration link for that one. I think it was last Tuesday that we that we did that one. Um, and I know that uh, my friend Anna is moderating. Anna, what's our next uh, uh, video? Oh, there's the form stack form coming through. So if you want to join us for our free Global Soundscapes movie day, uh, check that out Wednesday at one o'clock. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what we're doing next week on Tuesday because Anna usually does those, but we are definitely doing, um, we are definitely doing dwarf planets next week. So for those of you that have been asking and asking and asking, we're finally going to talk about Pluto. I promise. All right, not seeing any other questions come through. I want to thank everybody for joining us and make, and we'll see you next week on Tuesday. Ooh, we're going to be talking about glaciation with the Belle Isle Conservancy. That's going to be really cool. Um, so for those of you uh, that watch every day, every day, it's nice to see you. Um, and hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday at 